Oh, good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to today's uh, session of the Rotary Club of Kilkenny, our second meeting this year. We're delighted that uh, Niamh Mulholland, who is looking after the Rotary Foundation for our, uh, the Rotary Club of Ireland, and uh, Dermot Gaynor is our uh, chairperson of the, Internet, of the foundation uh, section of our council. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Niamh, first of all, uh, tell me a bit about your, your background, first of all. Who do you work with? Where did you come from? And what brought you to Rotary? So there's three quick questions for you. Yeah, I currently work with KPMG. Um, so I'm a lawyer by profession, which is interesting when you work with a bunch of accountants, uh, but I look after our regulatory division, our regulatory advisory division uh, for our financial services clients. And I have the, uh, I have the actually the honour and the privilege to look after what we call our asset management section. So all investment funds, uh, fund service providers, uh, investment banks and investment firms and brokers, they all, uh, they all form my client base. Um, my clients are Irish, UK, and US primarily, and mm. um, so that sees me. And I have some Asian clients as well, uh, so that sees me working across quite a few time zones. Um, but it's very interesting work. I came to it from the Central Bank of Ireland, where I uh, was in charge of an awful lot of the, the post financial crisis financial services legislation. So it's always really interesting to see both sides. And to a point Ian was making earlier, the theory that we had in Brussels, watching how intimately it plays out in practice and having to help clients work their way through the ambiguities of detail has been has been very professionally um, fulfilling. So I'm very happy here. Um, I hail originally from uh, County Loud, so I'm a, uh, the product of a, of a Northern Irish father and a, and a Republic of Ireland mother, and they settled near Carlingford. Uh, so that's where that's where home is. I've been in Dublin, though, as long as I was in I was in Cooley, and that's also where my Rotary origins are. So uh, very good friends of dad's uh, were key members of the Rotary Club of Dundalk. I'm sure you'll be very familiar with them and passed it to Governor Gay Burkery. And that club, a lot like Kilkenny, heavily involved in so many aspects of the community. Um, the Rotary Club members there are seriously unsung heroes mm. um, of our local community and they've been involved in so many brilliant projects over the years. Uh, so I was always very aware of it. Like many other business people, didn't have the time to give up his lunch on a Monday, but was always a supporter of the projects. Uh, something that I think our new membership structures are now starting to to allow us to bring in and to contemplate, which is great, because we always had that wonderful nexus of supporters um, to our Rotary Clubs. Uh, and when I left university, having had a wonderful time, I was then reminded by Fergus um, uh, McCarland, the Rotarian and past president of that club, that it was high time I gave back to someone else, uh, having had so much fun at college. So I joined Rotary at that point, ended up Rotary District Chair, um, then joined Rotary quite early. I didn't wait until 30. Um, I joined more or less as soon as I was finished after being district chair, I actually joined Dublin Central when Paul Hutchinson was, was district governor. And um, so that's over 11 years ago now, maybe 12. Um, and since then, I've been club secretary, club president. I've been district secretary and now DRFC. Wow. That is some rotary CV and some personal CV as well. I just was interested to hear that uh, you worked with the central bank when they were uh, endeavoring to uh, swim their way out of the financial crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once that was sorted out, you then uh, uh, take on the role of sorting out Brexit from your own. Uh, from, uh, so we jump from one crisis to another, to another. <laughs> or, or one complication to another. Perhaps they're not all crises, but they, they shift uh, the way the world we, the way we view the world and the way we got used to the world. And COVID has done something similar. Um, and the alignment of both COVID and uh, Brexit, uh, I'm sure is causing a lot of concern for the businesses that you deal with throughout the world. I mean, you mentioned KPMG having a global remit. Um, COVID, Brexit affects us perhaps more than any other country, but COVID affects the whole world. Yeah. And, we don't know how it's going to uh, shift the economic view of the world. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see how things develop. Have you any, or before we move on to talking about Rotary and uh, the Rotary Foundation, have you any views yourself on how COVID might affect the, the global uh, situation in relation to your own work? Yeah, it's sorry, it's been very interesting. And as you say, right, and even 
I even think COVID has taken precedence over some of the Brexit impacts as well. So I think the discovery on that will be a little bit slower because of the public health implications. And I think that's, I think that's right. Um, it'll be no surprise to anybody to recall most countries have taken on a substantial debt burden. Uh, that works quite well when you have negative interest rates, but a small increase in interest rates will actually have a knock-on effect. Um, I think our banking system, uh, the measures we put in place for liquidity and capital after the last crisis have been tested and broadly speaking stood up well. And it's an Irish plan at the ECB that took the extraordinary measures uh, in place to ensure European liquidity. And that's well worth noticing in the form, former Governor Lane. We did an exceptional job, I think, of, of giving certainty because the nature of course a vacuum and capital markets hates it more than that. Um, so it's the, it's the uncertainty piece that, that he took out of that, that I think enabled a lot of people to focus on the public health uh, aspects of it, which was a significant piece, but just not to forget, and I think people do forget that there will be significant economic damage uh, wrought on certain sectors of our economy. And it's not even, you know, it's people forget how many SMEs we have. So very much in our minds are the restaurants, the hospitality sector, but again, all their suppliers. Um, all of that kind of network and that combined with some of the supply chain problems that we've already seen in Brexit is just going to make it very challenging for domestic business and um, at a macro level from a global perspective enormous change I mean the change in the, the United States uh, politically is going to be very very significant and the events of the last week certainly have have shaken up a lot of people albeit that the financial markets shrugged it ever so slightly um, the other issue that I would have just from an Irish perspective, though, and, and particularly in financial services is the UK was always seen as, you know, who do we ring when we need to talk to Europe from a from a from a location perspective for the big US investment banks and asset managers and London was the place. It's likely that Ireland will become that place now because we're the last common law English speaking jurisdiction. And I think there's a big challenge and onus on all of us to responsibly and um, but to, to, to kind of take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and to kind of, you know, use uh, the expertise and the learnings and some, and some of the more harsh, right? As I walked into the central bank to start my job the day the IMF walked in, I was in the lift beside them. Uh, so I remember walking through uh, all those harsh lessons, but I think Irish people are extremely adaptable and very responsible actually in, on, on the whole. So I think we have a lot to bring to the European table and it will be actually very exciting to see uh, Ireland certainly taking that seat at the European table over the next number of years. So that's certainly a positive to, to look to. Great, thank you. Dermot, uh, you're uh, the person that has the most knowledge and breadth of vision around the foundation as far as we in Rotary are concerned. Would you like to uh, lead off by asking some questions of Niamh? Ah, Dermot, uh, you might unmute yourself, Dermot. I'm trying to hear now. For oh some... yeah, we can see and hear you. Okay. Hello, Niamh, and thank you for joining us. Um, I thought I'd start, Niamh, by just asking you the, the more general question of what exactly is Rotary Foundation? And then leading on from that, why is it so fundamental to each Rotary Club and fundamental to each individual member then? Yeah, it's a very good question, Dermot, and listen, my many thanks to you and to Ian for having me along. And certainly we were supposed to do this before Christmas, so thank you for bearing with me through some family issues. Uh, that we had to, to deal with. So it's good to finally actually have a proper chat with you. Um, look, from my perspective, the everything that we do in Rotary Service has an impact. Um, and it's amazing to see over the years. I mean, I had the great privilege when I was district secretary of meeting most of the clubs and maintaining relationships. And actually, when you listen to the clubs and no less uh, the Rotary Club of Kenny in particular, the impact you guys have had through the projects and services you have rendered locally to causes who oftentimes have no profile and have no platform. You know, there are people who, who wouldn't necessarily uh, get a voice or, you know, become provided for in terms of either just time or uh, or, or, or finances. Um, for me, the Rotary Foundation is the engine behind that. So for all the good work that each individual uh, Rotarian does with the symbiotic relationships they have in their club, with the supportive stakeholder relationships we have throughout the throughout the country, we can, we can raise X amount of funds that enables us to deliver out X amount in terms of projects. But the, the collective and the, and the brilliance of the foundation is, is that for every dollar that we're putting into that, that's being invested on our behalf, a very, very small percentage in, char in charitable terms is actually put towards administration and that's actually paid for by the investment uh, returns as opposed to the core contributions. And that allows us to, in many instances, double the financial impact that we can have uh, throughout the uh, through throughout the world, and um, so from the from the 
you know, the district, I mean, we approved district grants this year for, you know, a thousand euro, 750 euro, but in each case, there was a strong application for assistance and, and we knew that there would be a positive impact around that. So for me, as I say, Rotary Foundation is our, our financial enabler. And um, it's, and uh, interestingly, in my job, right, um, it, it had environmental, sustainable and governmental. So ESG, which you'll see a lot about in the papers, it has all of those facets and has had for many, many years because it's linked to our project structure, to our governance structure. Um, and it has that trust. So we rely on trust when we shake buckets or when we used to, or when we talk to colleagues and say, look, you know, we want to actually support a community project. We rely on that trust in our word um, for them to contribute to us. We in turn then can have full confidence in our own global foundation that enables us to kind of provide further, uh, further finance. The other piece as well that I think um, that we, and I, I've tried not to labour this too much, although I'll, I'll make a liar of me now at the next district council meeting when we'll talk about finances, but um, there's a lot more in terms of the foundation's programmes as well. So it's the foundation that powers our alumni programme, um, and we have significant uh, Rotary Foundation alumni and youth um, awareness of the Rotary because of it. And I suppose we don't always tap into that. But I recently read Matthew McConaughey's autobiography, and he was a scholar, um, and he went to the United to Australia. Um, I know that the the Chancellor of Oxford, she uh, Louise from Watford, uh, she was also a Rotary ambassador, ambassadorial scholar at the time, sent to the US. So we have significant alumni, and we have significant people who went on to make quite um, strong contributions in the area of peace and reconciliation, for example, by working in the UN and others, and um, who actually had access to the educational and awareness programs of the foundation so i say it's our own charity and um, it's it, but it, more importantly for me it's our own financial engine and the last thing i'll say and, and joe and jason obviously are our colleagues at the executive table but we've we've seen firsthand as you have and um, you know the benefits of utilizing that global structure to grow develop and enhance any ideas we may have so one of the one of the later developments potentially of some of the work in Lebanon that Jason's working very closely on with Barney is that we might send a vocational training team out there, which we haven't done yet. But two or three years down the line, you have that option to make that uh, to make that, that contribution. And we're leveraging like minded people all over the globe to achieve that, which is a huge piece in terms of efficacy and efficiency. Okay, thank you. Um, Follow-up question, uh, what are our responsibilities as a club and as members and are we doing enough in Kilkenny to support foundation? Well, I can, I've seen it. I've sent on a, a presentation just to Ian where I have a snapshot actually of your contributions at the moment. So a couple of things I'll say to you on this, right? So clubs are asked at the moment to give um, $100 per head to the annual fund or annual programs fund and 50 for Polio Plus. And we'll talk about Polio Plus slightly differently because mm. Ian mentioned taking over foundation at a very unusual time and, and polio has certainly been uh, hit quite substantially in those terms. But for me, equally as important as any contributions that the club makes is promoting the awareness of the foundation. So to be honest with you, um, it's as important that the Rotary Club of Kilkenny have a piece on a website, have a piece in their paper talking about successes in Africa with the polio vaccine, generating awareness, and making sure people know that we're actually doing this work. Um, you know, and I, and, and I think that's very, very important. Um, certainly in terms of, of the Rotary Club of Kilkenny and, and looking at the, the figures that I have from Rotary International this morning, and I'm wary about figures at this point in time because there's contributions made in December, which will only become live to me in reporting towards the end of this month. Um, but you guys are at $42 um, per capita showing at the moment, which is half what you gave last year. So already, um, Kilkenny are, you know, getting their contributions in, which is absolutely fantastic. So we can start to see that cash flow coming through. Um, and each of those contributions mean that the district grants, and you've been very active and run some flagship district grant projects, mm. which uh, in the first instance have been fantastic for the communities, but it's also useful for people like me to be able to say, look at what Kilkenny have done on particular projects for other clubs who are looking for support and encouragement. And in a COVID-19 environment, that's particularly important because I think a lot of clubs had their confidence knocked or, you know, look, it's a different way of operating. It's a different way of operating for me at work, for you at work. This is different for us. In ordinary circumstances, we'd be sitting in a room together and we would, you know, be having a, having a chat um, in physical form on this. So the fact that we have that kind of precedent and project plan and access, you know, to, to, to Rotarians who generously give up their time in Kilkenny to talk about, you know, how the, how the projects have worked 
that actually has a significant impact. And I have a couple of I have clubs, thankfully, that I can actually call on to encourage uh, other clubs to take the leap and to do it. Sometimes clubs don't want to hear from the district official, but like-minded club um, who's actually walked the line uh, that that is that is very significant. So for that, I I I, I thank you. You obviously also contribute very heavily um, at a at a district level, which is uh, which again is is huge, and it takes a lot out of a club. You know, Dublin Central also was a club that had quite a number of district officers sitting at it, and that can be a significant time commitment. And um, so from that perspective, I think you're you're doing very well. I think at all points, and this is something we'll be talking to clubs about over the next couple of weeks, is just getting that you know um, what. Rotary International and what we in District 1 uh, say is the frame of mind of foundation fundraising. This doesn't have to come out of your own pocket. What are the easy ways that you could actually make foundation contributions and also generate awareness uh, of, of the foundation while you're doing what you would want to do anyway? Um, and certainly then the, the final thing I'll say to you and something to consider potentially for next year as Dave Murray and I are, are looking at at the moment is global grants. So having been so successful at a district level, um, and being so proactive there um, in Ireland, we are great contributors to foundation, but we don't always actually take the amount of, of district designated funds available to us for global grants. So Dave and I are working on easy, a way to make it easier for clubs to join together, to actually avail of the global grant, to get that bigger bang for buck, for example, but also to enjoy the fellowship that comes with actually working with each other and, and, and doing that. So we have a club, three clubs at the moment doing it in the north, uh, and we're having a look to see if we can actually just just make it easier. So something for you guys to think about, because you have quite a bit of experience. I think you would take to the process really, really well. OK, I think I'm sure all our members will be aware of this. Our um, involvement in the postal survey is a big piece of our financial contribution and support for, for the foundation. Um, and long may that last. Um, is there anything else we could be doing by way of fundraising? And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in just an overview from you of, of the every year, every Rotarian scheme and sustaining membership. What would yeah. you be saying to us about those? Yeah, no problem at all. So every Rotarian every year is, is that this is your $100 contribution and whether your club picks that up in the annual subscription or members do it through sustaining membership as an individual com contribution, but that's just the overall umbrella term, that sustained contribution. And I can see from my numbers at the moment uh, that you have, for the year 2020-21, um, as of this morning, there were 10 EREY members in the club and five in sustaining members, but that could just be when your direct debit comes out. Uh, but you have a, you have 11 uh, sitting in there from, from last year. Um, so in addition to whatever my club gives my edge uh, on in terms of per capita giving which speaks to eory and um, i put in a hundred dollars every year and um, yeah. myself right and i think there's a couple of things to say on that one is that you know we've made a mountain out of a molehill for ourselves a wee bit and um, in that the administration around that setting up that standing order was a bit of a challenge and uh, we also just didn't have the benefit of the um the gift aid that the uk had because our our tax deductions are for a much bigger amount uh, of money. Um, however, I do understand that after quite extensive lobbying, we've now gotten RIBI to streamline the forms. It's a bit more like check the box, make it a bit more efficient, make it a bit more effective. So we'll certainly be sending uh, that information, that new information around, which should make the setting up of it quite easy. But the way we looked at it was for, for the price of a cup of coffee every month, that was my hundred dollars. Yeah. So it was, a, it was an easy thing to do. Um, it's not, we don't mandate it. It's not for everybody to do. Um, but for those of us who can, um, I think it's a, it's just an easy way to give that recognition. Uh, another piece that we'll be developing out, and I think it worked very well this year, is that Rotary Foundation managed to raise nearly $900,000 on Giving Tuesday, which is a US initiative, um, and we've come on, on board on that. So, you know, I personally gave them €250 Euro or whatever the equivalent was in dollars uh, towards polio because I was acutely aware that you know, club's ability, our ability to do all of the normal polio fundraising activities was totally hampered by COVID, mm. uh, which has meant that our, our overall, and I'll have this information for you at, um, at District Council up to date, uh, is the overall polio contributions have literally fallen off. Mm. And if they're really, really far behind and where they normally are, very, very understandable. Um, but at the same time, there is a, there, there is a big deficit, there's a big uh, hill to climb on, on that one. 
Deep, um, is there an in, would you have an indicative figure, a percentage, what percentage of members in the district are sustaining members or making a contribution themselves other than their club? Yeah, so that's done on a, again, which is, I think, Jeremy, maybe you've seen my presentation council already. Yeah. Um, that's something we're profiling to actually thank people for, for doing it. Uh, we don't have a very strong uptick. Um, so I think just off the top of my head, I think maybe we're tipping on maybe 20% ish or just under 20% yeah. um, of members in the district um, are, are sustaining members, for example. And um, there are very few benefactors. We have a handful, maybe four or five, what we call Paul Harris Society members, which is a thousand dollars contribution a year. And um, the benefactor piece is where you leave money in your will. But again, very complicated. If you have a solicitor in the club and everybody does which is how we did it, we had a solicitor in our club that he did the codicil for us for free and he did it while we were physically meeting. Um, mm -hmm. It can be a little bit of an impediment to do it. But at the same time, uh, once you have a, a structure like that, it's not, it's not difficult to do. So I think personal giving in district romantic, like, so it's not something that we have done particularly. Um, but I think that's very much balanced out by the fact that we do so much club giving. Like within RABI, we're generally around the top. So as far as I'm concerned, it's fundraising. People decide they want to make an individual contribution great. And um, for me, because I always have the dual hat of, it's it's as much about awareness as it is about as, as it is okay. about money. Okay. Um, on a declining membership, I think we need to make, you know, start having to think about who else we would bring in to make contributions to the foundation. And you may end up talking to, you know, appropriate corporate sponsors with good corporate social responsibility programs. And if that awareness and there may be 10 or 20,000 uh, dollars but brought in through the relationship that sits in the Rotary Club that will have a significant impact going forward. So would you be saying, Neve, that we're doing OK in terms of what we contribute to foundation, not just financially, but in other ways that matches matching reasonably well with what we get from it as well. And we have done well, I know, in recent years from the from the, the grant scheme. So we're. We're doing okay, are we? No, oh, it's more than okay, right? As I said, I'm, I, I said thank you very much for the for the contributions that have that have come in to date. Normally, we don't see them really until March or April. So the fact that you're, I say, fifty percent of what you were last year is already in the bank is is very significant. I mean, in eighteen nineteen, you guys gave in over six thousand dollars. Last year, you're four and a half thousand into the annual fund. So you know, no, in terms of uh, fundraising between club and individual um, giving. We certainly have a very very strong engine, and um, you know, you do one of the flagship, um, you do one of the flagship clubs for not just fundraising, but also what you do with the district grant, applying for it. You know how you how you actually then apply that in the community, and mm. um, so that's that. That's um, very very much recognised. Okay, thanks, Neve. I'm going to hand back to Ian now, or anybody else who has questions. But thank you very much for for sharing that with us. No what I find most interesting about what you had to say, uh, Neve was the mutually beneficial uh, way that the foundation works, that we give as a club or as individuals, but we also get back. And that getting back has aided our reputation within the local community in Kilkenny. For example, uh, the grants that we got in relation to uh, SOS, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, training centre and residential place for people with a moderate level of learning disability, for the Mother of Fair Love School, and most recently for the schools, uh, the School of the Holy Spirit, uh, where our Interact Club uh, had uh, an initiative during the summer uh, when everyone else was uh, moaning and doing nothing. Uh, and particularly a lot of Rotary Clubs were mourning and doing nothing. But our Interact Club was particularly active in fundraising for another school, um, not in their own, not their own school. Um, and the foundation, Rotary was generous to that project. And what I'd like to emphasize is that once we, it's not only giving, it's getting as well. Uh, and I, can you give me an example, uh, Niamh, of the type of, grants that the foundation has given within Ireland, not just here in Kilkenny? Yes, that's actually a really interesting question because uh, what, what you, your big examples are actually the, like the ones Kilkenny have direct, have direct experience of, which is actually coordinated by our local clubs, their community, their community projects. We tend not to be recipients of global grant money coming in. So this is what my core point about Ireland is very, very much as a district, uh, very much focused on giving, very much focused on international development, et cetera. 
It is, however, possible for us, and this is part of our, our global branch uh, initiative for clubs, it is possible for us to actually apply for those 30,000 plus um, uh, engagements, um, but actually apply, apply them locally. So one of the things that's been looked at at the moment, and actually I'm very glad you mentioned um, learning, uh, some moderate learning disabilities, et cetera, it's become a real key focus to me that our health services are, are exceptional, but they're acute and emergency services. There's a lot of chronic um, and there's a lot of, you know, long term services, which our health professionals are doing their best with, but they're very much to the second tier. They don't get the same level of funding. They don't get the same level of profile, but there is the same return on investment in terms of enabling people to participate in terms of their best lives. And um, so we're having a look at actually speaking to some, some of the consultants, some of the medical professionals to say, OK, what rehabilitation services where we wouldn't necessarily be seen as best in class in Europe or globally, might Rotary actually help with, um, with a more sizable global uh, global grant piece of set funding. So, um, that's what we're trying to look at at the moment. But as I say, you've good examples. I mean, it's it's the district grants, you know, levered up, mm. uh, and that's the way we we kind of would would look at it. Right. Um, I'm just look. I mean, uh, so many of the health services depend on voluntary organizations to sustain them uh, and that has meant that there's a, a, there's a diffusion of organizations for example in the southeast i think there are 42 separate organizations dealing with people with a moderate level of learning disability um, if you're a farmer you're a member of the IFA, whether you're a hill farmer in Leitrim or a rancher in Meath, you're still in the IFA. And there's a big problem with uh, so many separate organizations. And many of those approach us for funding. Mm -hmm. And they all are deserving causes. Um, but it is, it's a systemic problem that there are so many different organizations. And it, it's almost as if it was a case of divide and rule. Um, you know, was this deliberately designed? But each organization has its own goals. And even in our work, the three grants that we gave, all to people with a, le a, a, a learning disability, be it through autism, moderate le learning mm -hmm. disability, or mild learning disability. That's where all of our recent grants have gone to. Is there a danger that we're uh, that we're propping up the state instead of empowering people that's a very good question and i think for me and, and this is actually just a, this is my approach to life actually in general so it's it's an, it's an entirely personal view i always say you can only control what you can control i agree with you that our our system has evolved i say with a primacy on acute and chronic care or acute and emergency care which has meant that you have a lot of really good people looking after the long-term needs of others and um, this became very personal for me actually i have a cousin who has a uh, moderate intellectual um, um disability and her parents were told uh, that, and it didn't matter who, who she went to, she either had two options for her secondary schooling. She could go to mainstream school, but she was clearly going to be far behind the pace, the context and everything else. Or she could go to the one uh, school in the area for Down syndrome children, where she was going to be very clearly the top of that class. Um, but there was no in-between for her. Um, and I think as I said, that's, you know, it was, it was look, not a strategy that we as a family just went, right, fine, we're going to put her, you know, put her into the mainstream school and we will support her as a set of cousins and aunts and all the rest, that kind of stuff, right? So the beauty of Rotary, I think, is that we step into that and support yes. people who are trying to make the best of a situation that they cannot change. And I, there's a, as a, to come back to the Rotary Club, and talk, I mean, one of their fabulous but silent projects is they take people without family support uh, to cancer services. They take them up to their services in St. Luke's or wherever it is, and they bring them home, make sure they have dinner, but they have that, you know, they have someone with them, someone they trust, someone they have a personal relationship with. They take their half day and they're a companion to that person to make sure they're okay. They never speak about it. They never advertise it. But the absolutely huge human impact that has, oh, yeah. um, you know, is, is, is really, really significant. And, and uh, to me, as I say, you might end up propping up the state indirectly, but it probably it's it's worth every it's worth every inch of it. 
um, and we can only work within the constraints that that we have. Um, but I think less the government uh, starts paying attention to the other types of services that it has outside emergency and acute, uh, we're probably stuck with supporting those that we can support in the best way that we can. Mm, thank you. You you know, one of the things that uh, the Rotary Foundation or Rotary International is most famous for is its work in relation to polio. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this earlier. Um, it, there's, is there an inclination to think that now that polio is no longer a problem in Africa, where it was running rampant, in, particularly in Nigeria up to relatively recently, that is no longer a problem there, and it's only a problem in Afghanistan and Pakistan, which are uh, countries that are almost without uh, a normal rule, that we can therefore say our job is done. Yeah, that there's a big risk of that. And I was always taken by John Durham, former world president's view on this one, which was that it's only ever a plane right away. And by goodness, are we now seeing that with COVID, right? And that's really putting a sharp contrast into my mind. The other experience I had on this, actually, in the year that Barney was governor, we went off to one well, of the regional preparations he did and the world president was there and we were speaking about polio. And I was by far the youngest person uh, in the room. Uh, so one of my UK or, or UK counterparts decided to kind of make an example and kind of, well, you know, Neve has absolutely no idea what polio is like. Like she's so young, she's never seen it. What, what is your uh, empathy or your affinity with that? And to be fair to the man, he did have a point. So the polio, I always say the polio, the end polio now campaign was founded the year I was born. Um, so for all of my life, Rotary have actually been working for, literally, I was generation zero to make sure we wouldn't have to suffer that. So I'm case study one. Um, I've met only a handful of people uh, with the disease. I certainly wasn't in my lifetime aware of it, but it was live for my parents and very live for my parents. Um, and I think the I, as TV was, right, my father was in a TV hospital. Um, so I think we have to be very, very careful and cognizant of the fact that these diseases don't go away until you actually properly eradicate them. Um, I think there's a message that needs to go out quite clearly. And I think there's a, there's a number of videos now being released which help. I think the documents can be a bit turgid, which says that actually if you spend an awful lot of money finishing the job, you spend an awful lot of resources, as you say, in conflict zones and tricky areas where mass immunization is not possible. Um, and where you have to be very, very careful about just not polluting the water supply and things like that, but with vaccines, which did actually happen to us. And um, so I think there is an element of, you know, sealing the job, making sure it was done and actually getting to that elimination goal. It's very difficult, though, over the course of 37 years to keep motivation up. Yes. That, and, and that's a real that's a real and proper challenge. And I think for me, the one of the interesting things about COVID is, is that we weren't able to do our usual fundraising. We weren't able to do our usual awareness. But by goodness, has uh, a live uh, virus challenge the life out of us and to know that the mechanisms that Rotary put in place for polio are actually the ones the World Health Organization are using to track and trace coronavirus particularly in underdeveloped companies countries that's our infrastructure yeah they were able to actually use and utilize and to kind of get on top of it uh, in a way that we would have been seriously lagging behind beforehand so there is a there is a there is a I suppose a, a, an onus on us to uh, continue the fight. There's an onus on on, on me, and um, to try to get that information to you so that you can kind of keep um, making people aware that yeah, the last step is the most ex is the most expensive and also kind of the most onerous, but it's absolutely worth uh, it's absolutely worth doing. And if we ever needed a reminder of how fragile we are in terms of borders, uh, the and and how permeable they are, and um, if there's any sort of a research of one one plane ride brings it back to brings it back to your own front door again. Yeah, I'm reminded of somebody who once said that, you know, 90% of uh, the work takes 90% of the time. The last 10% of the work takes another 90% of the time. And the danger is that uh, th that complacency has set in. And I think that has happened in relation to this country and COVID, that there was a degree of complacency uh, once we hit low numbers in the summer. Uh, and people let their guard down. And the danger is that we as a body, that Rotary, could become complacent unless we keep that flame of information, that motivation uh, alight. And that takes people like yourself uh, talking to groups like ourselves to remind us of what we need to keep in our own minds. And at the forefront, we were instrumental in getting this far. 
we can't let our guards down now, uh, even though it's perhaps not as uh, as popular or as uh, urgent a need. It's still a need that we need to continue to address. Mm -hmm. um, do you see the foundation uh, in in how it approaches world issues shifting because of COVID? Um, not 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 particularly. So a couple of things have changed. Okay, so there the foundation have actually been looking at different types of of grants. So we have kind of um, projects of scale grants. There were our merge emergency funding was released out so we could use them for immediate COVID projects. I think one of the beauties of the foundation though is that it is actually extremely strategically organized. It tends not to be terribly reactive and um, it has the benefit and, and the trustees will say this of being able to leverage the, the common sense, the due diligence and the savvy of members all around the world. So when proposals are coming to it, they're coming actually quite, they're coming well baked right. So we're not, uh, we're very very well organized and, and very well managed. Um, and I think that's something that 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 does set us apart. We, again, we don't sing we don't sing it off the rooftops, right? But the foundation is highly accredited by international bodies because of that. Um, I think though it, they are having a think about and it. It came across a podium. We've had a number of regional calls on this, just about our fundraising, looking at areas where you have growth in membership and where you have growth in membership, it just takes a little bit of fundraising for the contributions to be met. But areas maybe where we might have declining membership. Or areas where we might be suffering just because the physical meeting was our discipline and it's difficult to get up the same level of enthusiasm for a virtual meeting i know that myself and um, so you know culturally when will we actually will we suffer because we're out of the habit of meeting each other for now what would nearly be 15 months uh, i think by the time vaccinations get rolled out so i think they're conscious of that from a from an income and a planning perspective and in terms of projects no it's just supporting uh, clubs who are coming, as I say, with, with very, very detailed plans um, to them. And it's about just making sure that we get the best access to the funding that comes back to us after investment. My own view is that when we do uh, emerge from this, that people will be so anxious to meet again. And also they'll have an opportunity to spend the money they haven't been able to spend mm -hmm. uh, over the last couple of months. And perhaps we may be able to take advantage of that. Um, I, uh, I'm going to ask if any of our other uh, members uh, who are with us this afternoon have any questions that they'd like to uh, put to Niamh. You can form an orderly queue if you like. <laughs> yeah, there doesn't I appear have a I think, uh, oh, yes. I have a question. Yes. yes, Nora. I have a question. I'm delighted you brought up the uh, issue of the Bequest Society because it's a very, very easy thing to do. And my second question is, my question is, uh, is Shelterbox still part of Foundation? So no, Shelterbox has actually spun off into a separate entity, but it was Rotary supported. So it started as a, as, as you know, from a Rotary club, it, it had its initial funding and set up um, from the Rotary Foundation. It then set up into a, into a UK private limited company to the best of my knowledge. Um, and it became foundation supported and the Rotary supported um, over the period of time. But as in terms of its own personality, um, I think it's it's separate from uh, and it would be a, an external party to us. So donate a donation to Shelterbox is not no. a donation to foundation. Yeah, that's okay. exactly right. That's exactly right. Thank you. No worries. If there are no more questions, I'd like to say thank you to Niamh for two things. First of all, for making your time available uh, today, but also for the time you're putting into this and for the work that you're doing while you're also busy with your own job, your own family issues and with life in general. To give so much time to something uh, like Rotary Foundation is truly to be commended. And I thank you for making the time available today to give us an outline of the work that you're doing. But outlook by return. Thank you very much, Ian Dermot, for the invitation to come to be the club. It's delighted, delighted to be able to see you all and have a chat with you, albeit virtually. Um, and sorry to a point you made earlier, Ian. I get you know ten times more out of Rotary than I think I've ever put in. Um, and it's it's a, it's a fabulous um, it's a fabulous um, a 
association to be part of and to work with so many like-minded people who are really just let's roll up the sleeves and, and do what we need to do and they're so generous in terms of time and expertise so it's there's certainly no thanks due to me and it's certainly nothing that Joe and, and Jason don't do either and work exceptionally hard um, at, at, a, at a district level so as it were we're we're a lucky bunch uh, in a time when a lot of people are unlucky and um, I think we are we're, we're very lucky to have each other and, and the ability to actually effect change at a time when it's needed so listen thanks to you and the club for the continued um as I say, support the foundation for the execution of excellent projects that we can be part of right that's that's a big uh, piece in my toolkit when trying to encourage others to to do similarly so my thanks to you and, and all your members for that well, uh, it's much appreciated, Niamh. You sent a presentation today, which I didn't really give you an opportunity to go through, but I will be sending it to all of our uh, uh, members, all 58 uh, members that we currently have on our, uh, on our books. And uh, a little reminder as well that uh, it's not too late for them individually to make a contribution to Rotary Foundation. Speaking of which, uh, we will be having a meeting next week without a speaker. Uh, we'll be looking at the success or otherwise of our fundraising uh, for the Remembrance Tree project that, has, that will be coming to a conclusion on the 23rd. That's on Saturday week. Um, we would ask members to have a look at the website. You'll see that there have just been in the two months uh, since it was launched, 41 donations. Uh, raising just over 2,000 euro, which is less than one-tenth of what we raised last year. This is, uh, I suppose, in many ways understandable, but it is a bit of a, a, a shock to see that so many people in our own club have uh, maybe found other ways of contributing, but that uh, we haven't really hit the sweet spot in the general public with all our publicity, with all our uh, um, newspaper coverage, radio coverage, and our digital uh, 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 QR codes around the city, it still managed to only raise uh, one tenth of what we raised last year. It shows that the personal contact is still the most valuable thing that Rotary can offer. We raised 22,000, over 22,000 euro uh, in 10 days last year. In uh, eight weeks, uh, we've managed only to raise uh, one tenth of that this year. And it's a salutary point uh, that I think we need to be conscious of. In looking at next week's meeting, we'll be just having a general discussion about uh, where we're going as a club. In two weeks time, we will have a speaker from the Citizens Information Service, Sarah Dre, uh, who is the development manager of uh, Kilkenny Citizens Information Center uh, on the parade. And she will be talking about how their work has changed in relation to responding to the public's queries over the last year. She will also be talking about uh, how things have changed for employers from a social welfare and uh, employment law perspective over the last year and how things have changed for employees as well. So this should be a, a discussion or a chat of interest to everybody. That's in two weeks time. Um, so I don't have any other questions. Does anyone else have anything to say this afternoon before we close up the meeting? Okay, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> and uh, thank you again. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, just with relation to the remembrance tree, yes. I have an envelope here with some uh, contributions that came into the hotel here. Uh, I, I don't know what's in it now, they're all sealed, but there is some small amount there anyway. Great. That's, uh, and that shows, again, you know, how valuable it was having you there in the centre of the city that people could drop in money. A lot of uh, potential donors maybe are a little bit uncomfortable with uh, online donations and having a physical presence uh, like uh, the reception desk at the Clubhouse Hotel uh, was a great help. Um, I hope that you managed yeah. to get through this year, Ian. Uh, last year must have been the most uh, challenging for you, and I hope that uh, the next year... Uh, at some stage uh, that we can emerge uh, stronger. Um, so I don't have anything else to say. If anyone else has anything, uh, maybe you can let me know. Uh, I'll be sending a recording of today's meeting out to members uh, this, later this afternoon. In the meantime, I look forward to seeing you all next Monday at 1 p.m. Fare you well. Thanks, Neve. Thanks a million, everyone. Take Thank care. You,